Here we are getting ready for a video on our graphics. This is for the workshop classes in week three, starting on the 11th of March, 2019. So we're just going to look at, at graphics in R, and this will be the last kind of practice session before we get into workshop classes that are assessed. So there are a few things that we need to highlight about good graphics, and I'm being inspired here by the work of Edward Tufte, who was one of the original writers about graphical excellence. And some of his advice appears on this title slide. And we'll go through this as we go through the presentation quickly. But basically, your task is to show the data. Rule of thumb, give your viewer or reader the greatest number of ideas in the shortest time with the least ink in the smallest space. Now, that it's often difficult to balance those requirements, but there are a few tips on how to do it. Uh, almost always be multivariate, so show more than one thing in a graph. That's the idea of the greatest number of ideas. But also, don't distort the data. Tell the truth about the data. We'll go through some of those ideas. So, the first principle, show the data. And here's the guy who wrote about uh, the theory of graphics back in the 80s. I'll just give you a few examples. There are three, oh, sorry, four data sets here, uh, and they look a little bit different. But if we look at the summary statistics of them, and this is called Anscombe's Quartet, it's quite famous if you want to look it up. Um, they all have 11 observations, um, two variables, X and Y. The mean of X is the same in all cases, nine. Same with the mean of Y. They have exactly the same regression line each uh, and the same goodness of fit about that regression line. But if we look at those sets of data graphically, they all look completely different, even though they have the same line of best fit through them. And that shows the power of graphics, I guess, over non-graphical methods of presentation. Sometimes I, I would argue that non-graphical methods like tables are better. But in this case, certainly to show the difference between the data sets, it was, it's much clearer and quicker to understand the differences using a graph. So that's why we use them. Um, good graphics, you can create some interesting, colorful looking graphs in something like Excel. And if you were good at coding, you could do the same thing in R. But I'm comparing the same data shown uh, using a, a fairly ornate graph on the left-hand side in Excel with a much clearer graph, I would argue, made using R. Uh, and there are a number of things that we will go through towards the end of this that suggest that this is a much better way of presenting the data. And the extra stuff on the left-hand graph and I'm not really blaming Excel, but it is easy to produce uh, interesting looking graphs in Excel. The stuff that we don't need, we call chart junk. For example, graded color in a regression line or in the background or even a colored background at all is chart junk. Um, extra decimal places where we don't need them on an axis, chart junk. It's information that's not required. It doesn't help show the data. All right. So we are going to go on and, and look at a few of those ideas and as we carry on we'll show you how to do them in r so we avoid distorting, distorting what the data have to say this is a bad example of an infographic uh, where the price of oil increases in 1973 from two dollars 41 a barrel to 13 dollars imagine if it cost that much now um, a barrel in 1979 because the volume of that barrel apparently in the in the diagram is much greater than about six times the first barrel so they've actually distorted the, the increase in price with those uh, graphical representations of real data they have been a little bit honest by providing the actual values but it it's overemphasizing the point. Um, another way that we can do it is to uh, use the psychology of visual perception. So if we actually uh, present different size symbols, for example, as showing numbers, um, it's possibly unfair because of the way the human eye works to use diameter or width of the symbols as a comparison. What we would understand better is the area. Okay, and that gives a more naturally visual comparison, uh, which is more realistic and avoids overemphasizing the very large values. All right, so let's 
move on. Um, the other way, of course, that we can distort data is by altering the axis. So in this case, it looks like the eagles are doing a lot better than the dockers because look, it's a steeper increase, but of course we haven't considered the vertical scale. And if we plot them on the same vertical scale, it's quite different. These numbers are made up. Okay, so good graphics reveal the data at several levels of detail. Um, so we, uh, a good graphic may involve several plots. A single plot or a single graph, an XY graph for a scatter plot, may not be sufficient to present our data. All right, um, and there needs to be a purpose for them. We don't put figures or graphics in just because we feel like it or they think they look good. Um, although Tufty reckons the decoration is okay, I would argue for scientific purposes it's not. Uh, and we need to integrate them with what else we have in our report or article or whatever and captions are really important and more on that in a minute okay so the scientific standards are that figure captions which we always need appear below the figures and we should be able to decode or interpret the figure without cross-referencing the the general text we just should be able to use the caption right so that means we need probably larger captions than we used to um, but that's a good thing. Uh, it means we have the figure plus its caption as a kind of standalone unit of presentation of data. The tradition is the other way around for tables. Their captions go above uh, the table. Why? It's just a tradition. We need to label axes. We need to include units of measurement um, in axis labels for a good graph. We only present numbers with the significant digits or significant figures, decimal places required. And it's good to use appropriate data transformations. And then the workshop class following this one, we're gonna talk much more about transformations. So if you keep all these things in mind, plus the advice of, of Edward Tufty, then we should be heading in the right direction. Uh, maps are a special example of a graphic. We're actually going to spend a whole session on maps later on. So we won't go into the detail of this. You can read, you know, pause the video and read it if you like. Um, needless to say, R can make pretty good graphs, uh, at maps I mean, and these will all, all prepared using R and probably the R Studio environment to help us along. So, um, there are very many different types of graphs and these are just a selection that we can present in R. And you've had a look at some of these already. We've had a look at bar charts. We've had a look at, sorry, box plots, bar charts, uh, scatter plots. We've had a look at plot of means. If it worked for us in the first prac, we've certainly had a look at histograms. Uh, we'll go on and add things like uh, normal quantile plots and other ways of, of looking at distributions in this session. Uh, and we'll also have a look at the power of a scatter plot matrix to show us relationships and other features of our data. So there's a few things that we suggest that you try today and uh, we will help as usual. But now to explain how we do it in R and R Studio. This is the second part of this video presentation, and we're going to use our studio to create a number of different types of graph. Some of them we've seen before, and we're going to add a little bit of customization to those. Some of them will be new to many of you, but that's okay too. So uh, what I'm going to do is just to, first of all, I, I have loaded a CSV file into a data frame which is SV18 and this is from the field site for this unit for 2018 uh, Smith Lake and Charles Villard Reserve so SV Smith Smith's Villard uh, and 18 obviously for 2018 and I've just chosen this one because it, I know that it has the combination of variables and factors which will make sense making the types of graphs that I hope to however you could use just about any data set that had the right combination. 
So I already have that data set right here in uh, loaded into my R environment. So we're just going to do a few things with uh, graphical parameters. The reason I'm adjusting this code here is that I want it all to be visible on the magnified screen that I'm using for the video. So do a very basic plot. So I know that there are two variables in uh, the SBA team data set calcium and pH. I know that calcium, when plotted against pH, remember this is our y-axis using so calcium as a function of using the little tilde operator and uh, pH on the x or horizontal axis. So I'm log transforming the y-axis because I know that the distribution of calcium is a bit skewed and that will give me a better graph. So let's just run that and see what we get. And it looks pretty lame. I'll make the graphics device a little bit bigger. Uh, but as we're used to, we get a lot of white space by default around there. Although we're getting a nice graph looking graph with a good spread of, of points that are not bunched around the axis. And that's partly as a result of uh, log transforming that y axis there. But you know, we don't have nice axis titles. I, I think there's too much white space. Um, and we could certainly do something about the spacing and, and aesthetics of it altogether. And that hopefully would make it clearer to read. So I'm going to set up some of the graphical parameters. And what I'll actually do is just run a few of those in isolation. I'm going to chop those out for now. I'm going to actually put them elsewhere on my screen, uh, not the one that you can see. And add them in little by little. Okay, so what we're going to do is adjust the plot margins. Uh, remember that a lot of the time in our, our margins or graph sides go in the order bottom first, one, and then clockwise around two, three, and four uh, at the right hand side. So these are my margins in lines of text, four, four, one, and one. And the MGP or margin for the plot uh, is a three a component vector and that sets the first one is the distance of the axis labels from the axis itself so 1.8 lines 0.7 lines for the distance of the the tick labels from the axis and zero is the actual position of the axis itself we can have the axis offset from where it's supposed to be but i would prefer to leave that at zero i haven't found a circumstance where that needs to be anything else so we'll run that and then run the next thing and you can see how the plot changes. So it's now filling more of the available space and starting to look a little bit more attractive. Uh, what else can we do? Well, um, some of these you will have noticed before. So just put a comma so we can put the next um, parameter in. Uh, font for the labels, that's the axis titles, equals two makes it bold. You kind of have to remember some of these things. And uh, what I'm gonna do is also to uh, use the console just to check something. So we're using the par function, right? Um, and I can check the value of any argument within par. And I know this is the tick length. Uh, and I just want to see what it is at the moment. So I can do that. And it's minus 0.5. So minus meaning poking out of the graph and they're quite long, 0.5. So I'm going to change that because I like the look of them pointing in. Uh, and I'm going to make them positive, 0.3. And see what that does right so we run those two lines again and we see the graph looking a little bit tidy you've still got kind of dodgy axis titles but you get the point you can make a lot of changes doing this so let's try a couple of other things uh, let's try adding in some scaling to the text and symbols for example I've just pasted those in. So character expansion 1.5, that's going to affect the size of the symbols. Character expansion for the axis is going to affect the numbers on the axis. And the labels is going to affect the titles. All right. Now I actually think the numbers are too far out from the axis now because our ticks are poking in rather than out. So I'm going to make that 0 0.2 um, and this one 1.3. Uh, and again, run the whole lot again. 
and you can see what happens. So I've probably chosen some numbers that were too big for the text, but often the default text in R, depending on the resolution of your screen uh, and the size of your graphics device or graphics window, can be a little bit too small. So, you know, we can play around with those, but I, we don't have time to do that right now. The other thing that we can do, of course, is create multiple frames. And we had a look at this the other day We're using MF row as an equivalent MF column, the MF meaning multiple frame. So and if we choose a multiple frame graph, we generally want to have smaller text so that each graph doesn't have huge text like this. All right, and maybe shorter tick labels. Let's uh, make them 0.2 and see how we go. And when R plots multiple frame graphs, it actually automatically scales some things too. So depending on the number of graphs that it's producing, it might scale the numbers that we put in further smaller. All right, so 2-2 two, two means a 2-by-2 two two matrix of plots. So we're just plotting four different graphs here. And they're all going to be fairly similar, but I'm just distinguishing them with different plot characters or symbols, 0, 1, 2, and 3, and you'll see what happens when we plot that. Okay, so there's our graphs, uh, and probably we could have chosen slightly smaller uh, font size, label font, and so on, uh, and maybe tighter spacing of the text elements, but we, we get the idea, so we could change those and if we want tighter spacing look we might try instead of four four three three make that one and zero point one and let's run that all again and see if we get anything slightly neater uh, look at didn't, oops didn't do anything because i mucked up my syntax uh, we can run a previous block of text using this so if you just run five lines you can rerun them that button and here we go so we're starting to you know you get the idea you can start playing around with these and produce attractive uh, multiple frame plots and so on sometimes the uh, function that we use will actually produce a multiple frame plot for us so those are some things that i would typically play around with using the par function i'll just show you one other thing so let's change one of these graphs I'm going to, for the symbols, use a much bigger line width, uh, equals 4. Uh, well, actually, we'll do it for both of these. Uh, and uh, that will do for now. I just want to see if that, okay, that's, now what, what we do notice there is that when we use a larger y, line width, squares and things are not quite joining up there's they are joined up with a sharp corner on three sides but not the fourth and that for me is an aesthetic thing that i don't really want to live with so i i can also add in uh, my line ends are going to be square and my line joins are going to be Lighted, right? and I'm going to run that whole plot area again, and let's see if so that sharpens them up. And the the plus symbols did the same thing. The upper uh, part of the plus sign there was actually rounded off, um, whereas some of the other ones weren't. So we can tidy up graphs quite nicely doing that sort of thing. All right. So there's there's heaps of different parameters to play around with. Uh, and to get some help on those, go to help, uh, PAR, right? And there we go. You can see there's a very long list of different arguments with the PAR function. That just sets up your plotting environment before you even draw anything. Right? Now I'm actually going to use my little room there to clear all the plots because I want to reset my graphics parameters in order to demonstrate some other things. So what we're going to do is plot the variable distributions. I know that my, my comment text is a bit dull, but I'm going to provide this to you. Uh, you can change the colors and things within our studio so you can see things a bit more. So I'm going to plot a what we call a cumulative dis distribution function. Um, there's just something funky I've done with this. It's actually use, and I'll scroll across, but we're plotting just the cumulative 
distribution function within that same data set for pH, um, we're changing the default axis labels. I'm actually using this syntax backslash u, which gives us a Unicode character. Um, and you can check this in using a, a word program, something just insert symbol and it will give you this the character codes or you can Google them or whatever. And this is my less than or equals symbol. And R accepts quite a few of these Unicode characters. So if I plot that, you can see what it does. I've got the less than equals to more. But I remember I reset my graphics parameters, so I've got all this white space around. But so the cumulative uh, distribution or probability function means that if I look at pH 7, that means about, if you read off the graph, about 0.3 or 30% of the samples have a pH less than or equal to 7. If we move up to 8, uh, the pH less than or equal to that mark is about half the samples and, and so on. And that's how we interpret a cumulative distribution function. Now, there's a special example of one of these called a QQ plot, which we'll deal with in a minute. Right, so let's keep going. I'm actually going to adjust the resolution. Bear with me because the text missing off the page is starting to bother me a little bit. All right, so that should rescale things a little bit and hopefully still be visible for you guys. All right, so that's what we just did. And we're back down to our cumulative distribution function. And the only other argument I've put in there is the getting rid of the main title. If I didn't have that, of course, it would plot a title above the graph, which I don't really want. Okay, so a, a more useful example of a cumulative probability plot is what we call the normal quantile or QQ plot. And it has specially transformed axes, as the, the help text says. It's it, within the car package is the best version of this because it's got the most interesting or useful information on it. Um, so if we start up the car package, run that line and then run the next block of text, um, we can show a QQ plot. And what the, the plot shows is that uh, the straight line represents the theoretical normal distribution given the mean and, and standard deviation of the actual distribution of soil pH. And if it did have a normal distribution, it would, all the points would lie along that line, or at least within the 95% confidence limits shown by the dotted lines. But we can see that there are a few pH values at, at high uh, values of pH that don't fit the normal distribution. So we've got a very, very slightly skewed distribution. Now, we'd, we'll learn in the next session how to test these in a more statistically rigorous way. Okay, so we can also group QQ plots by a factor if we want. I know that there are different sample types within this data set, so we can try that as well. And although the uh, the spacing and everything is pretty shocking, you get the idea. So we've got soil, sediment, and street dust in this data set. All right, histograms, um, pretty useful, right? Um, and we've seen something like this before. And notice actually that I can put a formula in a plot uh, and that's perfectly okay. Uh, you need to be careful with how you work the syntax, but it's, it usually works quite well. Okay, so we'll run that and there's our histogram, but we can, we can add a bit of stuff to it. Say we're interested in the proportion of samples that exceed a certain threshold. Well, I'm going to put in an imaginary threshold of what we call an AB line, Y equals A plus BX. That's the reason why it's called an AB line, but we're saying make a vertical line at a fixed value um, because we're using a log scale. I'm making it really explicit by saying we'll use log of 300. Uh, so let's run that line and there's our threshold line. So you can see the proportion of samples uh, or the frequency of, of observations that have concentrations above that imaginary threshold value. All right, so that's kind of handy to do. The other thing that's sometimes useful to do for histograms, particularly when we're looking at the modality of a distribution, whether it has one or two populations or peaks in a distribution, is to put a smooth frequency curve on it. So we can do that by, uh, sorry, a smooth density curve on it. Uh, frequency equals false, and then it will plot probability density instead of frequency. The thing will look roughly the same, um, and it does, but um, 
we've got a slightly different, well, a, a definitely different scale. So density instead of frequency on the y-axis, and then we can add our smooth curve, which is our probability density curve to that. So something like a smooth distribution, all right? And there it is. There's a little bit of evidence that we might have a shoulder of a second population on there. It's not really clear, and I wouldn't over-interpret that, but sometimes that can be evidence. That, for example, we have two distributions present, particularly if we have two clear peaks. So that just adds a little bit of power to your graphical analysis using histograms. Uh, box plots, again, um, you've seen these before. This is the type of thing we did before, where we've got box plots grouped by a factor, that is sample type. We've added um, better access titles to this, of course, and deleted the title above the graph. Uh, we can make it look better, of course, with the um, by changing the graphics parameters. Um, and if we run the rest of this code, uh, we can make a more attractive looking graph, although you don't have to use color. Um, you might as well, but something that's useful in here is how to put a subscript or superscript in, and that, that can get quite complex. This is using what we call an R expression, uh, and within an expression, anything in square brackets becomes a subscript. Right? And there's there's lots more options you can have with that, and this can get awfully complicated to do that, but there's a simple example. All right, we've colored them in. You don't have to do that. Um, you know, least ink and all that from Tufty. Um, we can add an AB line. If we want a threshold here, obviously our concentrations are now on the vertical axis where they were on the horizontal axis for a histogram. So our AB line is horizontal in this case, H equals whatever. Um, and we can add a label to it using the text function. All right, so text, coordinates, what the text is, the labels, and I'll show you another example of this later. And then change the size of the text and the color and the position relative to the coordinate. So remember our one, two, three, four. So if our coordinate is right here, one, two point uh, is log 10, 300 again, um, three is above it. One would be below, two to the left, four to the right. Right, scatter plots. So we've been here before. Um, let, let's look at a different type of scatter plot. All right, we've had a little look today already. Um, Iron versus depth, right? Now we've got two columns in this uh, worksheet, lower depth and upper depth, as you typically do for a soil horizon. Um, and you can plot them like that, and you can see that iron seems to vary with depth. Uh, and we've got upper depth as well. The question is, which one do you plot against? Well, probably it's more useful to put the middle of that uh, depth range in rather than the extremes. So we can actually, again, put a formula calculating the average into the plot function, but this time we can't use this syntax using something is dependent on another because that itself is a formula, so it won't allow a nested formula. So we have to change the syntax x then y separated by commas. We run that and we've got our mean depth, but we've got nasty axis titles now because it's just using what's in the formula to give us the axis title but we can change all that, right? Okay, let's keep going though. Um, normally we'd want depth to be up and down, that would be more intuitive, right? So we can just swap the order of our variables. Um, so let's try doing that. And that's okay, except depth is now going the wrong way because we've got zero at the top and larger depth at the bottom. We really want it backwards. And the way that we can do that, um, is by using the y limit or y lim parameter. And uh, if we run that the way you'd normally expect to, 0 to 100, it just gives us the same result, right? It's going 0 to 100 in the positive direction. But we can actually cheat a little bit and put 100, 0 in the opposite direction. And if we run that, then we get something more like a depth concentration profile. Okay. Even more conventionally, especially in soil science, we um, we might want to shift the horizontal axis up to the top. Well, I'll show you how to do that in a minute, but let's get going with the rest of this as well. So we tidy up plot margins and so forth. Um, 
back to what we had before. I think we've already done most of this and plotted again with, with some nice axis labels. Let's just run the whole lot of that. Okay, so we start to look a little bit more. We've got mean depth in centimeters and iron and units of measurement. Remember that's important. What if we want that axis on top? All right, well, we can do that. Um, but what we need to do is actually suppress some of the x-axis information. We leave the y-axis as it is, but we want no label on the x-axis. And we're, we're saying x-axis type is equal to none, n for none. Um, so let's plot that and see what we get. All right, so far, so good. Um, now, we actually want to put the axis up here and the label at the top, so we're going to need to change the margins. It's one here and four here. We want it the other way around. So let's run our parameters again. Okay. And plot it again. Okay. And we've changed the margins. And now what we need to do for the rest of it is to add an axis manually. Side three, meaning one, two, three, four. And then add M text or margin text to that and set it up the way we want it. Uh, font. Okay, that should write, should work right, and then there we go. So there's a fairly traditional depth profile, showing that there is some dependence of iron concentration and depth. The highest concentrations are occurring not at great depth, not at the surface, but at some mid-depth, right? So that can be quite useful. Scatter plot matrices are a really useful way to explore the data. Um, again, they're in the car package. We already have that loaded, so if we ran it again, it does nothing right doesn't matter um well it's the the syntax looks a little bit like this it's kind of uh, a one-dimensional function so we just put the right hand side of our function after the uh, squiggly line um, specify the data set and put some other parameters in in this case we don't want a smooth line so let's let's try that and see what it does we've still got the same graphics parameters so hopefully that will make the plot look reasonably nice we've only got four variables here but um, and we could put another one in actually because in my subsequent graphs I do have that we put sodium in as well and let's rerun that uh, and you can see we get a matrix showing the relationship of everything to everything else right which can be quite useful except these are hard to interpret because of the very skewed distributions of some of our variables so aluminium calcium iron and sodium right um, but the other thing that we can do is, is separate things by sample type, and sometimes that can clarify things for us. Sometimes it won't. Uh, so let's try that anyway. We'll run that. All right Now, you might want to think about changing the graphics palette at some stage. Uh, I'm going to look in my history. Um, Uh, okay, so car palette, uh, and I'm just going to run this. So I'm going to click the button that says put it in my source, which is basically my text file. And here's what my I want my colors to look like um, using one of the functions in car. If it was not car, we'd just have it as palette. Okay. We'll, we'll run the car palette now. I'm just going to run that and then run our... And we get some more reasonable colors here and I'll just maximize it again so it plots nicely. Just remember that we can zoom out on these plots as well. Um, and then we have a resizable window so we can get a little bit more detail on things. Okay, but I'll, I'll leave you to play with that sort of idea. Strictly speaking, there is also a legend somewhere in there, um, and it doesn't plot very well. But if you have a higher resolution screen, you might have more luck with that. But we're still having problems with our skewed variables. Now, I've actually gone and calculated different variables, um, a log transform column uh, for aluminium, calcium, iron, and sodium. Uh, but you could also put formulas in here. You can also equivalently do something like this. Okay. That it does the same thing, but let's undo that for now uh, and run the rest of this. Okay, just to show you what else is in that function. So I'll run that. 
and so now we're we're getting the better separation of points and if we if we zoom that out we'd be able to see things in enough detail to start to understand a few of the things that are going on and whether there are consistent relationships for anything and of course we could do this for a much wider range of variables too of course so scatter plot matrices don't underestimate them as a really good tool for exploring data maybe even generating hypotheses which you can follow up with better statistical analysis right okay um last thing for graphics before we uh, say farewell for today anyway um, i've in my environment got some maps which are created with the uh, R package open street map. So I've actually forgotten the line here. It's reminded me to require open, oops, if you spell it right, you should get some predictive text happening. And there we are, require open street map, and then I should be able to plot the map. Or I'll just run the first couple of lines of code, and you should be able to see what we get. Let's make that a bit bigger. All right. So what I actually want to do, I think, is to reset my margins. Let's go up to where I made it, 1441, and put it back to the way that we usually have. Run again. I'll go back down to maps. Now look, here's something interesting too. If we put four or more hash symbols at the end of a line, that becomes a heading that we can get to in our studio. Useful, huh? Anyway, so let's uh, run that line again. We already have OpenStreetMap loaded. Okay, that's not doing anything. Ah, okay, I know what I did. Um, I had text selected, whereas, okay, so we'll go back and find that again and run. All right traps for young players, including myself. Now, I've actually got a, a data frame with some places on that, and this is to illustrate that we can treat a map simply as another type of scatter plot. All right? So if I use the function points, it will actually add them to an existing graph. Um, if we really want to be fussy about that, we can say add equals true, Oops. and true should come up as a logical operator in a different color, uh, but we don't, strictly speaking, need that when we use points or lines because it should plot on the existing plot that we have. Right, and let's see what happens if we run that. It's gonna add some points, of course, at particular eastings and northings, so coordinates on the map, and it's gonna give them different symbols according to what type they are. So let's see how we go, run. And there they are, some places on the UWA map. Now I've also got another um, piece of information that I can add. I can actually add the type as text, and this is quite handy. So we can put the text at the same coordinates or offset from them, but say that the labels are not equal to one text item, it's equal to a whole column. So at each point, it will plot the value of type for that particular row. And I'm gonna also change the color of text according to what the type is. And I'm gonna say position equals four, which you're beginning to understand will be on the left of the symbol or the coordinate that we use. All right, so let's run that. We find that there are the libraries and cafes on the UWA campus, just in case you didn't know already. All right, so and we can do other things with that text, of course, if we uh, say, character expansion equals 0 0.7 for instance um, and let's plot the whole thing again we can change the size of the text this is something a bit more neat and tidy if you want and there are, that's quite flexible um, we add to our map manual axes in this case and we're done right so we'll spend a whole session on maps another time but that's about enough for now I think